Here are the companion notes to the exercise Resistive Circuits in Tinkercad. As an aside, I'll say this is the first long-form lecture record video I'm recording, and so there's going to be some mistakes and words. We're just going to run through it as we, if we were in class. So please bear with me, and these will improve over time. The first circuit I want you to build is simply measuring a resistor with an uh, with a ohmmeter, a resistance meter. Here's the one case where I'm going to just show you what it looks like in Tinkercad before I draw the circuit. So here we have Tinkercad, the resistor, it's a 1K resistor, and connected to it is the multimeter set to the R mode for resistance, otherwise known as an ohmmeter. If I start the simulation, it doesn't do much, it simply reads a value, 1.00 kilo ohms, 1000 ohms. In practice, with a real voltmeter, what's happening is it's sending a small current through some circuit, in this case the single resistor, and measuring the voltage that develops across it. it that is an active process where it actually applies a little energy to something to measure it. So generally we only use this on an isolated component or an or a isolated circuit, and not on a powered circuit. Um, otherwise the power just confuses the result and you get something in, uh, that doesn't mean anything. So in practice, when we actually try to draw this out, what this is going to look like is we have a resistor, uh, and then the universal resistor symbol is this kind of zigzag line. And I'm going to put a value on it, 1K. And I'm going to show that uh, the two terminals, one terminal is connected to uh, one side of an ohmmeter, and the other side to the other side of the ohmmeter. And again, in this case, the ohmmeter is this active component that is applying energy to the component in order to measure its properties, which is distinctly different from the voltage and current readings. So that is, that is the very first case here of, of the circuit. The second example circuit involves a potentiometer and a battery. So we'll go ahead and draw that. A battery has a symbol with these parallel plates, which actually is a physical analog to the structure of a battery with dissimilar metals and electrolyte between them. Uh, the positive terminal, negative terminal. In this case, uh, I recommend using a 9-volt battery. There's several in this Tinkercad kit you can use. And what we're going to do is apply this across a potentiometer. Potentiometer is a kind of resistor that is special because it has a wiper that can actually move along the resistance and uh, touch it at different points. And uh, this is actually very familiar to you. You've seen this in analog volume knobs uh, in electronic equipment of all sorts. Uh, behind that knob is a potentiometer, which is a, which is a type of variable resistor. In this case, the volt, we're going to use a voltmeter to measure a voltage. And Voltmeters always have to measure the voltage between two points. In this case, we're going to measure between the wiper and the negative terminal, which in general case we're going to call the ground. This is the, the lower rail, the negative, the ground, the zero potential of the circuit. And uh, the resistor has a total value, which is, uh, I recommend in this case, 10K, although you'll see that for this particular circuit, the actual value shouldn't matter much. What's actually happening in this case is that we are forming a, a what's called a voltage divider using two resistors effectively inside. As the wiper moves in some sense, different amounts of resistive material are captured between the end terminal and the wiper. And so it's the same as having two resistances in series where one resistance and the other resistance, the total value of R1 plus R2 is the value of the component, in this case 10K. But as the wiper moves, the effective resistances of each leg of that bridge uh, change, um, according literally to the amount of resistive material between the wiper and the end. So what we're thinking about here is the fact that there's the battery forms a potential across a resistor. It causes a current to flow through the resistor. As the, as, the, as the current flows through the resistor, it's losing potential. And the wiper allows us to sample that potential at different points. For a linear potentiometer, there's a linear relationship between, uh, in this case, between the voltage and the position. Um, not all potentiometers are linear. Sometimes the volume knobs and stereos actually have a nonlinear function to better create a kind of perception of constant volume. All of our potentiometers will simply be linear and have this relationship. So this is a this ends up being a basic application of kind of current law and and uh, uh, Ohm's law to sort of re uh, rep relate the current voltage and the resistance across the two. The third example is a basic demonstration of how we might sense the voltage on a switch. So a switch acts as a variable resistance in which either in one state it's uh, open, there's no connection, and it's effectively infinite resistance. No, no uh, current will flow between the terminals because the switch is open. Now, 
we want to be able to sense the voltage across this. So let's go ahead and think about having having a switch circuit with a push button in this case, which is a it's a single pole, single throw switch that has either is either unconnected or connected. And we can put a voltmeter across it to measure the voltage across the resistor. But we still see some way of getting a current to either flow through the resistor or not, to the switch or not, in order to sense what's happening. So we're going to add some sort of power source, in this case another battery. Here I recommend, just for familiarity, using a 3-volt battery. Now, if we simply wire the battery to the switch, we'd have this problem where when the switch is closed, we'd short out the battery and effectively a very large current could flow. So instead we're going to add a resistor, which will, as the name might suggest, resist current. And uh, in this case, a typical value might be 10K or 10,000 ohms. And now what will happen is when the switch is open, the, the resistor will basically allow some teeny tiny current to flow, just enough to bring the circuit node uh, at the top of the switch up to the full supply potential. When the switch is closed, then current can flow through the switch. Now the switch becomes a zero ohm resistance when it's closed. So zero ohms, right, for the simple relationship of, of a current time, uh, ohm's law, if the resistance is zero, then the voltage across it has to be zero, no matter what the current. So we know that the voltage will then go to zero volts. Some small current will flow through the resistor. In this circuit, some small amount of energy is dissipated as heat in the resistor in the closed position. But that's the cost of giving us a small controlled current to sense the value of the switch, whether it's either zero ohms of a short when it's closed or infinite resistance when it's open. This will be an essential circuit for coupling switches to Arduinos because the Arduino typically has a voltage sensitive input. So this produces some uh, basically the equivalent of a digital input uh, from a physical device like a switch. Um, and that's sort of our, our core input circuit. It turns out also that I have wired this here with the resistor on top as a what we call a pull up resistor. The circuit works equally well in reverse, but the logic will change. If we take it and we move the switch to the upper leg of the bridge and the, and the resistance at the bottom, uh, in this case I'll just draw another battery here. This is always also equally correct. When the switch is open, not pressed, then no voltage will develop across the resistor because no current can flow through it and the voltage will be zero. And then when the switch is pressed, some, some current will flow the resistance, and we can measure that voltage using the voltmeter, or, like I said, the Arduino input. There's arguments pro, pro or minus either of these two approaches, which we'll address later. Yes, when the switch is unpressed, in the first case, there's inverse logic, because the switch is open and the voltage floats high. In the second case, when the switch is not pressed, the voltage is low, and it's plain logic. Okay, we're going to do a little trimming. Our next example is about the properties of LEDs. So what I ask is that we just simply take a, a battery, and starting with the 9-volt battery is more dramatic, and wire it directly to an LED. First, to comment on LEDs. These are light-emitting diodes. They're active devices. And the first thing to know is that they're directional. There is a positive terminal called the anode and a negative terminal called the cathode. And current only flows one way through the LED. If you wire it, if you re uh, reverse bias it by wiring it backwards, then very little or no current will flow, and it certainly won't light up. The second thing to know is that LEDs are not resistances. They have you can estimate their properties as a resistance, but it's not a linear constant resistance. the The current that flows through it is highly dependent in a nonlinear way on the voltage. So if we just simply take a nine volt battery and run it through uh, an LED. That much voltage across a typical red LED will just blow it up immediately. It'll literally melt the chip down inside the housing. And that's because it's trying to conduct too much current. It tries to, it basically for a, a small moment, a lot of current flows through it and it heats up and something just melts. So this is not a recommended practice. If you, instead of the 9 volt battery, you try a 3 volt battery, uh, depending on the LED, you'll get some lighting. For uh, a red LED, it'll glow very brightly and probably burn out quickly. Uh, Different LEDs turn out have different voltages based on the color and the chemistry. So a blue LED often runs at 3 volts or more, so it might be perfectly happy running at the 3 volts. Um, but the red LED, which typically has a forward drop voltage of 1.6 to 2 volts, somewhere in that range, will, will definitely uh, be destroyed by, by running too much current through it by a 9-volt battery.
So, of course, in the lab, you can measure, you can do this and watch the LED uh, turn black or sometimes even explode. Uh, in Tinkercad, it simply pops up a warning that you're burning out the LED, and so you know, there's no immediate cost. So, how do we solve this problem? Uh, and the simple case is the most common way we do it is by building a very simple resistive bridge using a resistor as a so-called ballast resistor. And adding a resistor in series with the LED allows uh, a, a, simil, a small amount of voltage stabilization. If the LED tries to draw too much current, more current flows through the resistor and, it's, and it regulates. So to see this, I take a battery and I'm going to run it through a resistor. And if we're using a 9 volt battery, I'm going to start with a 470 ohm resistor. And then from there, I'm going to run it through my LED down to ground. And in this case now, there will an equilibrium will be reached. Some current will flow through both the resistor and the LED. The, the LED will have a typical voltage drop of, let's just say for round numbers, uh, 2 volts, sort of 1.6 to 2 volts. And then the simple application of the sort of series of voltages rules uh, says that the, the voltage drop across the resistor then has to be 7 volts, because the sum of voltage drops across the resistor LED have to sum up to the battery voltage. With a 7 volt drop across the resistor, if we look at uh, V equals IR, 7 volts divided by 470, uh, you can do the math, is sort of a reasonable current. The, the LEDs that we use have a, typically have a maximum current of 20 milliamps or so. That's the highest recommended running. You can put more current through it, uh, and it will still work up to some other absolute maximum limit. But 20 milliamps is the number here for kind of a reasonable limit of, of current. There, are, there do exist much higher parallel LEDs, especially now that we have so many lighting LEDs. There's LEDs that can actually consume considerably higher currents. But the basic 5 millimeter indicator LEDs we use, 20 milliamps is a pretty universal number. Now, in, in the example that I asked you to do, I also asked you to instrument the circuit to look at it. So let's look at that for one moment. I'm going to draw it again here, 9 volt battery. through resistor, the same 470 ohm resistor. Now to measure currents, the key thing about current measurement is you have to actually run the current through the meter. So you have to put it in circuit. The voltmeters are very convenient because you apply them between two circuit points. So for, for most purposes, they don't disrupt the circuit. They can simply be, be metered into, onto the circuit and then removed without any changes. But the current meter needs to be actually inserted in the sequence in order to actually have currents run through it. So the current meter goes in circuit, and then from there we can uh, take the LED that we have before. And now the voltmeter, which measures potentials between two circuit points, can be applied uh, between any two circuit nodes. In this case, we're going to apply it across the LED. And in this, is, this is the actual example that you're going to build and Tinkercad and play with, and then you'll discover that you can observe the current flowing through the resistor LED loop and observe the actual forward voltage drop of the LED. Of course, in the simulated case. That's the glory of Tinkercad. Things work. Uh, there are so many little gotchas that happen in physical life that don't show up in Tinkercad, but we have time to come to those as we actually build things on breadboards. For now, um, and just enjoy that things work in a simulated way. The next example is almost silly. It's basically building a flashlight. If I take my, uh, but it, it, it basically proves the points about having uh, currents in uh, flowing in sequence through elements and having uh, the ability to switch things. So if I take my switch now and I run it in sequence through my ballast resistor and through my LED. And again, for a 9 volt battery, I'm going to recommend that we use a 470 ohm resistor. I have basically built a momentary flashlight. Pushing the button allows a current to flow through the, 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 the loop here and the LED should light. If I release the switch, in this case it's a push button, then the LED will turn off again. The order of components doesn't matter. The same current will flow through all three things in series, and so I could switch these around and have exactly the same effect. Where the, uh, the precise voltage drop across each component will be the same, because the current will be the same, although the voltage is relative to ground, of course, depend upon other the ordering. Reversing the LED, it won't light. The LED is a one-way unidirectional uh, current uh, in the forward direction. So once again, we have it drawn like a little arrow with the anode on the top and the cathode on the bottom in this case uh, for the positive and negative terminals. 
A brief aside about switches. There's a nom nomenclature for this particular switch. It's a single pole, single throw switch. In fact, actually, it's a momentary contact, SPST. And the reason for this is there's other variety of different structures of switches. The other switch that you have easy access to is a slide switch, which is a single pole double throw. And the reason for that is there's the slide switch has three terminals. One is a wiper that mechanically can connect to one of the other two. So the wiper is effectively the pole, and the other two th uh, positions are called throws. This is a single pole double throw switch. It's also not momentary contact. You move the slide switch to a position and it stays there. And so the, the symbol, the circuit symbol, is reminiscent of the mechanics of it in that there's a physical moving part that m makes and breaks contact. For many switches, there's actually a small interval in the middle where it makes no contact at all. And for some other switches, there's a small interval in the middle where it makes contact with both of the throws. So one has to be careful, assuming that there's a specific mechanical behavior on the switch. Of course, once again, Tinkercad will be perfect here, and I think it's probably make before break, uh, break before make on the as the pole moves between throws, but you could test that. So that's a brief aside about switches just to see that go. Now the last example introduces a analog photoresistor, which is a variable resistance, which base, is based upon uh, senses light. The typical variable resistor that we use is a so-called cadmium sulfide cell. It's based upon the physical chemistry of, these, of this chemistry. Um, as light impinges on it, its resistance drops. In total darkness, it has not an infinite resistance, but a very high resistance. And in very bright light, they typically get down to on the order of one to several thousand ohms. So it is a, it's not a bad way to sense ambient light levels. It's not terribly fast. The response times on these can be measured in tens or hundreds of milliseconds. So it's better for use as a light level sensor or an illumination sensor, not for measuring some kind of rapid patterning. So in this case, we're going to take a, another a voltage source, a battery. We're going to run it through the photocell. And then we're going to add a bridge resistor. And oops, I'm not terribly well drawn there. Uh, and we'll say roughly 10k is not a bad value. And then measure the measure the voltage drop across this with a voltmeter again. So what we'll see here is when there's when there's no light at all, and in Tinkercad you simulate this by dragging a slider into darkness, effectively that resistance is not in circuit. It goes, it's very, very large. And so no current should flow. When it's in total darkness. When the circuit is in total darkness, effectively the photoresistor won't conduct. It has very high resistance. And so we should see zero volts develop across the 10k resistor. There's no current flowing through it. Once we add bright light, then some current will flow through the photocell as its resistance drops. And we'll see current flow through the bridge. And that'll develop a voltage across the 10k resistor. And so the result is a transduction from light to resistance, which causes a current to change. And then the 10K allows us to develop that current into a variable voltage, which is then easy to sense. And we can sense that using, for example, like the Arduino analog inputs, um, which we'll come to later. So that's a brief recap. We covered seven simple circuits. Each of them is based upon a voltage divider with uh, two components in series in which the relative resistances can be varied. And that allows voltages to develop that um, we can use either to control the current of the LED or to sense the position of the switch or the light level on the photocell. Thank you all.